All right, I'm going to open up the waiting room and let everyone in. All righty. Perfect. We're going to give it just another moment. I see a few other people connecting their audio and their video here in the waiting room. All righty. Hi, everyone. We're excited to have you all here on, on this Monday morning. I'm going to pass it over to a member of our, our Adult Education Committee, Lisa Goldberg, to introduce today's speaker. Please note that we're going to use um, the chat for Q&A. So if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to drop them in the chat so that way we can um, we can address them and look at them um, throughout the presentation, but we're going to use the raise hand function later for Q&A and also dropping them in the chat is the, the best way to submit questions. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I am thrilled to see so many people here and I'm thrilled to see my, my friend and classmate who's going to be uh, sharing with us today. Um, Joseph Berrios, uh, so good to see you um, joining us from Orlando, Florida. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Joseph is a descendant of Conversos, served 29 years in the U.S. Navy as an aerospace engineering duty officer. He holds a Ph.D. in computer engineering from the University of Florida and a Master of Divinity from Asbury Theological Seminary. During his studies at uh, ATS, he was inducted and became a member of Ada Beta Rho, the National Honor Society for Students of Hebrew Language and Culture. He is currently a rabbinical student at the Academy for Jewish Religion in New York, along with me, one of my classmates. Uh, Joseph is a student member of Nishama Association of Jewish Chaplains and is a member of the US Coast Guard Auxiliary. He is a recipient of the UJA Scholars Graduate Fellowship his authenticity is reflected, of course, and I know this firsthand, and his compassionate and empathetic care for those who are, ex who are excluded and marginalized. And when the Adult Ed Committee came to me saying that they wanted to do a program on this, I knew exactly who the speaker should be. And I am so thrilled that Joseph accepted uh, the invitation to, to do this for us. And it is my pleasure to introduce my friend and my rabbinical school classmate, Joseph Berrios. Ah, good afternoon. Thank you for being here and for the opportunity to give this presentation. I'll go ahead and put the slides. And please feel free to ask all any questions you might have during this presentation. So, Conversos then and now. The first question is, what are Conversos really? And Conversos is a term, why well, this is going, sorry. Conversos is a term that is used to describe those Jews that were forced to convert to Christianity during the Spanish Inquisition. Usually there have been other instances that Jews have been forced, but, but in general, when you use the term, it's talking about those that are descendants of that tragic event that happened in Spain. Other terms that have been used to define them are anusin, which is for Hebrew for coerced ones. And interestingly, this term is also used for victims of rape in Hebrew, anus. They use the roots for this word to describe those victims. The other one is maranos, which is a Spanish word for swine. This term, as people have created more awareness about the term, it has become uh, regarded as a derogatory term. And it has started slowly being phased out as a term to describe crypto Jews. Crypto Jews is those Jews that practice their Judaism in hiding. And the root of this word from, from crypto that is Greek for hidden or secret. And another term is Nuevos Cristianos, which in Spanish means new Christians. And this was during the, this term became very popular during the Spanish Inquisition because the jurisdiction of the Spanish Inquisition office was not with the Jews, but rather with the new Christians that they were not considered true Christians. So they were called Nuevos Cristianos. The communities in Spain, it, nobody knows when did the Jewish community started to flourish in Spain, but many scholars believe that the earliest that there was a Spanish community in Spain was documented is as early as the first century of the common era. And this is based that on the Christian New Testament, it states that the Apostle Paul 
had the intentions of visiting a Jewish community in Spain. And in the New Testament, it states, when I go to Spain, for I do hope to see you on my journey and to be sent on by you once I have enjoyed your company for a little while. This is in Romans 15, 24. And many scholars believe that this is indication that there was a Jewish community because Paul, on his missionary trips, he visited Jewish communities. However, what the, the, archaeolo the archaeological evidence shows is that the earliest evidence of a Jewish community is the second century of the common era, that there are Jewish gravestones found in Merida, Spain. Then after that, after the, the end of the Gaonic period, after the Talmud was closed, and Zoroastrianism became the official religion of Babylon, that then the Jewish academies had to be disestablished and they had to emigrate out of Babylon. Many Jews left Babylon and they went to Spain for two reasons. First of all, for better opportunities. And second of all, because they were looking for lands that were conquered by the Muslims because they felt that they were more open for them. Jo Joseph, and, we'll have yes. to pause for just a second. The processor you mentioned using earlier, the screen is blurry, the font. Could we try going back to the screen, share the other option? Sorry for the interruption. Sure, no the problem. Thank you. We're going to try that one. Let me just go ahead and share screen. Please let me know if this is better. Much better. Thank you. I know it worked in our test run and then it got a little blurry there. So now we're back on track. Thanks. Not a problem. So after the Gaonic period, after the Talmud was closed and the rabbinical academies had to be disestablished because there was no longer no religious tolerance in Babylon, many Jews, they traveled to Spain for two reasons. First of all, for opportunities that they have. And second of all, because they felt that they were going to be much better under Muslim rule. And very interestingly, after the death of the prophet Muhammad, there were two caliphates. One of them was the caliphate of Baghdad, which many consider that they conquered their subjects by the sword. And we have the caliphate of Andalus in Spain, which was more tolerant that they were the ones that were interested in philosophy, religion, rediscovery of Greek philosophy. And the Jews under Muslim rule in Spain, they flourished. And that's the next slide. And this period is known as the golden age of Spain in what well, that while the eastern side of Europe was in the dark ages and no pursuit of knowledge was pretty much eradicated the Spain had their Spain had their own renaissance and there were advances in science math arts philosophy and medicine and this is evidenced by some of the famous rules Jews from Spain which include Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon Rambam or Maimonides which was a Sephardic Jewish philosopher and practitioner of the medical arts. We have Abraham ben Samuel Abu Lafia, founder of the prophetic Kabbalah, and Rabbi Moses ben Nachman Nachmanides, which is a leading medieval Jewish scholar, Sephardic rabbi, philosopher, physician, Kabbalist, and biblical commentator. And in this area, it flourished both the intellectual philosophy side of Judaism and also the mystic side. And many of the, on the intellectual, we have Rambam. And on the Kabbalistic, we even find that the Sohar and many works that defined uh, mystical Judaism were actually had its roots or that it flourished in Spain. However, the lock of the Jews turned for the wars. When, during the wars, in which the Moors were expelled from Spain. And there was a war between Muslims and Christians. And this war culminated when Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabel of Castile, they got married. And this marriage was mainly a power grab that by them marrying, they unified the kingdom under one kingdom. And 
Queen Isabella, she being like she became like the mastermind of unifying this kingdom. It was not King Ferdinand. She, it, it, everything was being done internally by Queen Isabella. And she decided that to unify the kingdom, there needed there needed to be an official religion. And he had it, her religion was Roman Catholicism, and that's why one of the names that she was also known was as Queen Isabella the Catholic. So the policy of the kingdom under her rule was that unlike, um, I mean, it was that either the Jews had to uh, convert to Catholicism or they had to be leave the island, the uh, leave the lands. Um, the, something interesting is that the Jews that live under Christianity in the Eastern Europe, they did not accept Christianity, but in the case of the Sephardic Jews, as soon many of the communities, when they came to convert them, they said, we're not going to fight, we'll convert to Catholicism. However, what they did is that they, most of them, they just did it on the surface, and they continued to practice underground their Judaism. And that's why they were known as crypto Jews because they kept their Judaism in secret. Therefore, the Spanish Inquisition Office was established as a judicial institution in 1478. An interesting fact is that the Roman Catholic Church or the Pope did not establish the, the, the original Inquisition Office, but rather it was established by the monarchy in Spain and the uh, religious advisors of the Queen. Another interesting fact is that the target were the conversos because the Jews, I mean, the Inquisition Office didn't have jurisdiction over other religions. It was just over Christians. And that's for many people, they didn't know what it would have been worse, either to convert to Christianity and be subjected to the Inquisition Office or to be Jewish and then become scapegoats of society and at the end being expulsed from Spain. And one of the concepts that is interesting is that also under this office, the concept of pureza de sangre was developed, purity of blood. And according to this belief, Gentiles, they were pure Christians. But however, when Jewish, Jewish, Jewish people converted to, to Christianity, they brought the Jewish blood, so they made impure the Christian blood. And, and it was that's why so many, many peoples, they considered that the Spanish Inquisition was the first Holocaust or the first Shoah, because this was the first persecution against Jewish people and that it was um, labeled under a genetic term, because in that thing they didn't have DNA or genetics, but they used the term blood to refer to the same concept. And the Spanish Inquisition, was so profound that it became part of Spanish culture. And to this day still felt. Like for example, I'm gonna give a Spanish saying that I learned when I was a kid. Hoy es martes, no te cases, ni te embarques, ni de tu casa te apartes. Today's Tuesday, do not get married, do not sail away, do not leave your home. The saying, I'm going to break it down to what it means. Today's Tuesday, do not get married. The reason is that the Sephardic tradition was to get married on a Tuesday. And this tradition is based that on the third day of creation, God created life. And this was to cement the idea that the married couple were becoming partners of God in the creation of life and to continue the job of creation that God started in the beginning of Bereshit. Interestingly enough, if you go to the Christian gospel, the first miracle that Jesus performed was turning water into wine in a Jewish wedding. And the account of the gospel states that the wedding was performed on the third day of the week, on a Tuesday. And the quote of the New Testament is the following. On the third day, there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And this is in the book of John. I forgot to put the 
quote, but it's, I think, the second chapter of John. The second, now we're going to go to the next part. Do not sail away. The reason is that it was assumed that if you sailed away, it meant that the owner of the house were Jews that were expelled from Spain. And this meant that the house was up for grabs and the members of the community will go to the home, vandalize it and steal the property. Do not leave your home exactly like the previous one that it was that if you left your home, it was um, assumed that you're going to be expelled. So they'll go to your home and steal your property. So that's where this saying go comes from. And to this day, is still um, used. Another term that it is um, derogatory term is foul language is the term judio, but with an O. I'm going to say because most of us speak English here, judio, which in Spanish it is equivalent of the F word. But what people don't know is that that term was a cursing term that it was used that if someone was um, going to be tried by the Inquisition office and they were condemned, then they used the term, that person is jodio. In other words, that he's screwed. And it was also a way to curse the Jews. And to that this day, that term is still used in Spanish throughout Latin America and Spain. So this brings us to Christopher Columbus. That Christopher Columbus, on August third, he made his faithful voyage to the New World, and his findings were the first step into a new, into the process of a process that created a new world, an avenue for religious tolerance and freedom. And Columbus lived during the period of the, of the Spanish Inquisition. Now many scholars believe, including Jose Rugo, Otero Sanchez, Nicolas Diaz Perez, that Christopher Columbus was actually a secret Jew or a converso whose voyage has a different objective than what he claimed to the crown. When he was about to create this voyage, he pleaded to the queen that he needed a crew to man his ships. And no one in the Spanish community wanted to go with him because everyone believed that the earth was flat and they were going to go to their certain death. So what he did is that he pleaded to the queen that he wanted the prisoners, that they would be the perfect people to go with him as crew members and as original colonizers for this voyage. And the queen agreed with him because it was a win-win situation for her. She was getting rid of the prisoners, and if they died, she was not losing anything because she was getting rid of them. And the prisoners were none others than the conversos that were in, held in the prisons from the Inquisition office. Originally, the voyage for Christopher Columbus was set on August 2nd. And August 2nd in that year was the commemoration of Tisha B'Av, which is a fast day of mourning of the destruction of both uh, temples. So what he did was um, Columbus postponed the trip to August 3rd. And another interesting fact is that the voyage was exactly two days after the Jews were given the choice to either convert or to leave Spain. And many of those Jews also went with Christopher Columbus in his voyage. There's um, another link that we have with uh, uh, Christopher Columbus, in which a linguistic professor, Stel Irisari, uncovered the personal letters of Christopher Columbus. And this provided for him insights about Columbus' Jewishness. After she analyzed the letters with similar letters, she concluded that Columbus' writings were really, in fact, Ladino or Judeo Spanish which is the Spanish dialect of the Sephardic Jews that lived in Spain. Another um, interesting fact about Christopher Columbus is that there was a mystery symbol that he'll write on his letter 
on the top left that it was right, written from right to left, which is common on Semitic languages. And a Semitic professor by the name of Maurice David states, on all these intimate letters, the attentive reader can plainly see at the left corner a little monogram, which is in fact nothing more than an old Hebrew greeting, frequently used among religious Jews all over the world, even to this day. This sim mysterious symbol that he was able to decode is actually the letters Bet and He, B-H, which stands for two readings. Either it stands for Baruch Hashem, Blessed is God, or Be'ezrat Hashem, with God's help. Not surprisingly, the letters that Christopher Columbus sent to the monarchy, he omitted this uh, symbol. It is also another popular belief that the crown of Spain funded the trip to the New World. But some scholars argue that actually the financing of these trips was actually by Luis de Santangel and Gabriel, two conversos and Rabbi Isaac Arbabanel, which took funds from their own personal pocket to fund the voyage. And then there's another question. Why did the, these Jews take interest in Columbus' enterprise to the New World? which is another interesting question to ask, and that's scholar's question. Simon Wessenthal, in his book, Sales of Hope, The Secret Missions of Christopher Columbus, he, he states that the motivation behind Columbus' journey to the New World was to find a safe haven for the Jews from Spain. Others believe that Columbus wanted to obtain financial gain from the traffic of gold and the spices from the New World so in order for him to accumulate wealth and in that way finance the Jews to perform um, some sort of a crusade to take back Jerusalem and to establish the third kingdom, I mean the third temple. So why did the Jews went to the new world? The new world brought to the conversos a new life in which they could practice their Judaism with more freedom and autonomy. They could still be Catholics on the outside to not raise suspicion to the crown and to Spain, but in hiding, they could continue to practice their Judaism because there was no Inquisition office in the New World. So they, there was no interest to bring because everything was supposedly in Spain. The local authorities were not very active in covering secret Jews and sending them back for trial to the motherland. However, they started to change on 1513 when Bishop Manso found that in Puerto Rico did not align with the religious expectation of the Roman Catholic Church. He went back to Spain and he provided an account to Cardinal Cisneros on the condition of the island. And he suggested that the Inquisition office had to be established in the new world to remedy this problem. And he uh, advised that the someone had to be established as this provincial inquisitor for the new world. And Bishop Manso was vested with this title. And the reason that he started Puerto Rico is because Puerto Rico is exactly in a strategic point in the Caribbean that you can go from all parts of the new world. And that is like in the center of the new world. So, I'm going to give a background about the clothing that they use for the um, um, for the conversos that were uh, captured. It's the San Benitos, which is a sack of coarse yellow cloth with a red cross on them. And then they'll put figures of the devil and instruments of torture among flames of hell in their vestments. And then they were doing what was called, the process was called purification of blood, pieza de sangre which again, it was to eliminate those that were, came with Jewish blood, that they had to be eradicated. So, on the writings, it is written that Diego de Torres says in his memoirs, Manso was made inquisitor, and he, being the first, may be said to have been the inquisitor general of the Indies, 
the delinquents were brought from all parts to be burned and punished here. The Inquisition building exists till this day, 1647, and until the coming of the Hollanders in 1625, many San Benitos could be seen in the cathedral hung up behind the choir. And I'm going to say what they did as part of their tortures. One of them was to burn them alive on the stake. But what they did, unlike in Spain, is that they'll put them like in a covering shell. And the idea was that, like, for example, when you put someone to burn, what happened with the individual with the fumes, they get knocked out. They become unconscious and then they get burned and they don't feel they're burning. So they die. It's painful, but it's not, when it gets to the advanced stages, it's not that bad. In the case of the new world, what they did is that they put them in a shell for the idea that in the process, they'll feel that they're getting roasted. And it was to make them to feel excruciating pain before they became unconscious. In the part of the hanging, what they did is that they'll bring the conversos, they'll hang them up, and then on the Cathedral of San Juan, they'll have them in the background as a prop while during the Catholic service of Sunday. Once in the 1800s, 1900s, I mean, in the 19th century, the Inquisition office was disestablished. There were um, many revolts. One of them was the Grito, of, Grito de Lares, which was right now is seen as a um, revolt for freedom. But really, it was a religious revolt, and it was funded by Jews. Spain, what they decided is that they were not going to longer pursue the Inquisition, but that the Jews, they had to keep everything secret that they could not talk about. It's like they didn't exist. And even when I was a kid, in my history books of Puerto Rico and the story of Spain, there's no mention of the Inquisition. There's no mention of the Jewish communities. There's no mention of the Inquisition offices in Puerto Rico. There were two Inquisition offices, one in San Juan and one in um, San Germán which these, um, when you take into consideration that Puerto Rico is about the size of Rhode Island, which is an extremely small island, which is significant that they had two inquisition offices in two separate places. The one of San Juan was tore down. The one of San Germán became a church, which is abandoned. And folk legend has it that when people pass by, they listened to people screaming from this uh, building. And nobody touches that building. It's like a uh, folk culture that they have with this building. And many people don't know that it was actually an Inquisition office. And right now, the documents that they have when, um, in the end of the 19th century, when um, Spain lost Puerto Rico, after the Spanish-American War, and it became a U.S. territory, Spain took with them many of the documents that they had in Puerto Rico. And they took the documents that regarding the Spanish musician, and they have them sp sealed in Spain. And they, unless you get a special permission from the Crown of Spain, you're not allowed to read them. And part of the reason I've been told that they are closed is because they don't want to make uh, open the atrocities. And there are some uh, legal communities of the, uh, of, on the conversos that they're trying to find uh, ways for Spain to pay for the damages that they do, like some form of um, this type of payment that now they're trying reparations for what they did to the conversos. And, the, and in Spain, they're not making these documents available to the public. In the case of Mexico, the, the Inquisition office arrived in 1571. And what they did, the conversos, is that they went deeper into the frontiers to escape detection. And they arrived in many places such as New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Arizona, and California. And some of the things that they did, so in that way, for them to identify that they were Jewish, like, for example, in Mexico, in their sombreros, 
they will put like a talit in the area of the rim of the hat. And that was a way that they could identify that they were conversos. In another practice that they did in Latin America, and I remember this from my aunt, is that they would say that their patron saint was uh, Saint Esther. First of all, Saint Esther, she was the queen of the book of Esther that she was the first for crypto conversos and crypto, crypto Jews. They convert as a, consider her as the first crypto Jew. And what they did is that they made her into a patron saint and they made it like a local culture and they made, made it like a Catholic spin on it. And what happened is that the Roman Catholic Church, they accepted it and they allowed the crypto Jews to continue their practice of Queen Esther. And some people believe because they did this practice, guys, as Catholic, that there were costumes, that were celebrations before um, Easter or Passover. And many people believe that actually this is where the ideas of the new world, of the practice of the Carnival of Rio and Mardi Gras could have originated or at least had some influence because they had this practice. And what they did is that the crypto Jews, they were symbols of Queen Esther, and that was a way to identify them with themselves that they were conversos. I say that this touches me because when I was a child, I had an aunt that when, um, I think it was during a funeral service, I saw that she had a pat um, the symbol of a patron saint around her neck. And I asked her who she was, and she told me that it was Saint Esther, and that she was the patron saint of my, our family. And that's where the practice really came from. That it was a way of conversos to keep the practice, even though they didn't know where it came from. The Catholic Church, they never made a patron saint, but they accepted it. But that was a way that they could communicate that they were conversos. Another practice that it is popular in Puerto Rico is Octavitas. This is um, eight days of celebration that is done after the day of Epiphany, January 6th, which is eight days of celebration, of drinking, of lighting fires. And actually, this practice, it was a way that conversos practice Hanukkah in a hidden shape within the Christmas period, that it was hidden and nobody knew that actually this was, they were fomenting their Jewish practice of Hanukkah during the winter season, but with the twist that it made it look like Christian. So from the 16th century until the 6th, 17th century, hundreds of Jews were martyrized at the stake for their Judaism. Thousands were tortured, burned alive, lashed, imprisoned, exiled, publicly shamed, and buried in effigy. And what this means is that they made a figure of that individual and they burned it. And that was because either that person died in jail or escaped and they couldn't find him. Let's say he went to the, or she went to the jungle or was able to sail to somewhere else. So they'll burn them in an effigy as a way to curse them and a way to say that they have burned to hell and that they have pretty much cursed that person, even though that person was not physically dying in the process. An interesting fact about the story of the conversos is that women played a critical role in the community. And they were the ones that actually passed, kept the tradition and passed it to new generation. They carried this burden nobly. And actually many of them, they risked their life immensely. And one interesting fact about it is that many of the women that were condemned to die, they received one of two titles, either rabbis or dogmatizers. And this is important because from the 16th century until the 18th to 19th century, this is the first time that I think that women were addressed as rabbis because the Eastern communities, they didn't give that title to women. But in the Spanish Inquisition office, those women that were teaching their Judaism to their children and to their family, were called by the inquisitors as women 
I'm Swabai, I mean. So this is an interesting fact that they were bestowed for the first time the title rabbi. So the leaders of this community transmitted rituals and liturgy. And one of the most important liturgy, I mean, rituals that they kept was the fast of Esther, which became an extremely important and solemn period for the crypto Jews. And many of these women, they brought to the new world and they kept and practiced many practices of mysticism and Kabbalist practices. And one interesting fact is that when many of these women, they come from being conversos to being uh, Jews in our communities. Like in my community, most of the women that they come back to and reclaim their Judaism, they align more with mysticism and Kabbalistic practices than with the, the intellectual philosophy side of Judaism. And they were considered that the women were the caretakers of this, this esoteric wisdom. So what is the response that we have on the issues on, on, on the conversos? So there are many discussions that there are about this issue, not only on the halakhic issues, but also on theological discourses about what well, I consider the apostasy of the time and about religious oppression. Question includes is, may an anus or may a converso be called to the Torah, open the ark or even give the command, you know, honors before that individual is circumcised? Is the wine of crypto juice considered kosher? Are contracts like, for example, marriage between crypto juice considered binding? Um, if a conversion procedure for descendant of the conversos or the unseen, if they have to undergo the conversion process to be gained into the community, what is the value of the observance of conversos of the commandments? And what procedures for repentance is appropriate for them? So as you can see, there are many questions that, are, that arise that even to this day, many of our Jewish communities don't know how to handle because it's a challenge. Because, like, for example, if you have an Ashkenazi Jew or Eastern European Jew that comes from secular parents and then they come back to Judaism, they're automatically accepted. But in the case of conversos, even if there's an establishment that they have that lineage, that they are actually Jewish, they're suspicious about them because they're so far removed from their Judaism that it creates questions of what is the right approach to deal with them. So, one of the approaches is that to view the crypto Jews as babies in captivity in which they were not responsible for their um, practices of being so far away from Judaism because it was not their will that they wanted to convert to Christianity and live Judaism. They were coerced to it. So therefore they should not be held liable for what their ancestors did. In the case of women being teachers, Rabbi Yom Tov Ben Moshe says the following, the righteous elderly woman of Portugal about whose pity we have been told from whom the Torah and Judaism go for, they are the ones who have brought the sons of Israel on the wings of the Shekhinah. So, I mean, in the past, it used to be like a conflict because women were not allowed to be leaders. And yet in the Converso community, women are leaders to this day. Now, in the reform and conservative traditions, that's not a problem. But in many traditional Orthodox communities, they still have a problem about how accepting Converso communities in which women have such a prominent role and then bring them to communities that then they have to reverse it back that the women don't have such a um, prominent role. The positive side is that now in many modern Orthodox communities is that last year, they uh, on modern Orthodox community in Israel, they named a Rabbanit as their leader. And I know that the next um, president of the Neshema Association of Jewish Chaplain is that Rabbanit, that she's the leader of, a, of an Orthodox uh, congregation. 
So now that's being changed. Sadia ben Maimon Ibn Danan, a later 15th century, made the following response to the conversos. The seed of the apostate is coerced, and the descendants of the Anusim are coerced as well. They are isolated by the Gentiles who call them Jews and hate them and curse them all day long because of their inclination to Jewish teachings. And that there is a reward for those who put themselves at risk to observe some of the commandments more than the reward of Jews who have no fear of danger. And God does not indict over the coercion. Sadia based his response on the writing of Maimonides Rambam on this matters. His, in his eager uh, uh, Shema, he says, and many remain in the place of Shema and preserve what they could of God's commandment in secrecy. In conclusion, there is no sage from among the sages of Israel who calls the generation of Sham complete Gentiles or totally wicked for their transgression was against their will. And for many Jewish communities and Jewish leaders, because they were forced to convert not because of their will, they are considered Jewish. And for these people, like for example, if let's say a crypto Jew dies, if any, some rabbis on traditional synagogues, if they bring them, the family goes to them, they'll completely deny to do a Jewish burial because they were not part of the Jewish community. But some rabbis, especially those that come from this background or that they are keenly aware about this situation, they don't have a problem performing a Jewish ceremony for this deceased individual. Rabbi Solomon Ben Shimeon, during a compose, he composed a special prayer for the returning Anusim of the 15th century. And Rabbi Juan Mejias, which is a Colombian rabbi, that he lives in the United States and he's um the, of the very few Latino rabbis that I know, knows that this special prayer is a formula for making the return of crypto Jews one of that formally recognized the status of their act as returning to full affirmation of their Jewish nation that they had never fully relinquished. And this special prayer states the following, our God and God of our fathers, Bring success to your servant and bestow your grace upon him, just as you have moved his heart to return in complete repentance before you. So may you plant in, in his heart love and fear of you. Open his heart to your Torah and guide him in the path of your commandments, that he may find grace in your eyes. So may it be, and let us say, Amen. Conversos today is that the Jerusalem Post estimates that 25% of the Latino population are descendants of the Anusim. This is an interesting fact because if you go to almost all communities, like here in the United States in general, it doesn't reach not even 2% of the population. And when you go worldwide, it does, the population is not that, I mean, the Jewish population is extremely small. And in the case of Latinos, this is a huge anomaly that 25% of the population have some form of Jewish ancestry. It is estimated that in Latin America, around 650 million Latinos have Jewish ancestry. And add to this assessment, the estimated 60 million Latinos in the United States, and including Puerto Rico, which is a part of the United States, and the numbers becomes overwhelming. The Jewish Agency of Israel estimates that the total population of Sephardic B'nai Anusim, or conversos, is 67.78 million. It is not only several times larger than the Jewish Sef population of Sephardic communities that they continue practicing their Judaism, but also it is four times the size of all the total Jewish population in the world. And that includes Ashkenazi Jews, Mezrahi Jews, and the various other groups. And Shluman C. Halevi says, wherever there are Latinos, there still are families aware of their Jewish heritage. 
And this is important because this is a huge thing because I'm going to say that it is estimated by that 2060, the Jewish population in the continental U.S. is going to skyrocket to the point that it might be the majority of the United States. A minority of conversos were told explicitly of their Jewishness by their parents. Frequently, a grandmother passed on their family secrets to one elect granddaughter of their choice, whom she sometimes raised herself, thereby they preserve the matrilineage and the matriarchal tradition. Some speak the old Castilian dialect and they're ridiculed by their teachers and their communities for not knowing proper Spanish. And this dialect is consistent with Ladino and Judeo-Spanish or Judeo-Spanish. And um, the family passes sayings that have been passed by generation. Some of the sayings include El Señor or whatever, Hashem or whatever you want to do, es mi Dio. Hashem is my God. El sábado es el día de gloria. Saturday is the day of glory. And of course, the hoy es martes, today's Tuesday, do not get married, do not sell away, do not go far from your home, which is a reference to the Spanish position. And candle lighting on Fridays is widespread among Anusim. Another one is that they don't eat pork. Another one is that uh, when there's mourning, or a death in the family is that they um, get for a period of mourning, they do um, close themselves, they isolate themselves, they cover the mirrors, and then for a week they do services of observance of the death, in which they do Catholic prayers. But on the way that they do it is very similar to a service observing the dead like it's done in judaism and interestingly enough usually it's a lady of the family that leads this prayer services not a man and the transmission of traditions as well as family genealogy was entrusted to the women and many obscure practices of your judaism are practiced by yanusim some of them fasting on Mondays and Thursdays as penance, sweeping floors towards the center of the room, uh, really out of respect for the mezuzah, orienting the best north-south. And the forms of this practice do is an ancient custom unaware of their religious significance. And the links of conversos and their basic observances indicate a historic link to the ancestral faith. And the revelation regarding conversos has been into the new world has been a discussion about correspondence within the Ashkenazi and Sephardic rabbinate. Rabbi Aaron Slovak writes the following. I'm taking the liberty to write about the people in the Americas who claim to be descendants of the Marranos of Spain and Portugal. They must be treated like full Jews in every way, counted for Minyan, give Aliyot, etc. Only when one of these Anusim wishes to marry a Jew, must he or she undergo full conversion. That is, he or she must undergo immersion in a mikvah without the blessing and full acceptance of his vote or commitment to the Torah. A man, if he's uncircumcised, must, in addition, undergo circumcision. He's, if he's already circumcised, then he has to undergo half that damberit, which is the drop of blood. Rabbi Sobeki's letter assures the complete return of the Anusim is done thoroughly, but with the compassionate embrace of the Jewish community. However, most conversos feel very hurt by the repudiation of their heritage implied by conversion. So many of them, they don't want to go to conversion, because they feel that they are Jews, just like if an Ashkenazi Jew, they are um, Jews on name only, but they're, I mean, they don't, they're not practicing Jews. When they come back to the community, they're accepted and they don't have to go through a conversion. The conversion certificate received by the Anusim has generally been the same as one received by a Jew of choice that goes through conversion. So this mass was matter was recently added by Rishon Lesion Mordecai Eliyahu, 
who ruled that conversion should begin uh, which is a certificate that she or she returned to the ancestors, to the way of their ancestors. Rab Eliyahu further distinguished that in this process of return and conversion by reintroducing Solomon Duran's prayer for today's returning Anusim. Rabbi Stephen Leon submitted in 2009 a resolution to the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism that Tisha Be'av should also be a day of formally remembered the Inquisition and welcoming the return of the conversos. It was passed unanimously in 2020. This resolution was published in English and Spanish, and I believe that this is the first resolution passed by one of the major streams of Judaism using the Spanish language. And the emerging conversos stipulated search for many years and went until they are fairly certain before they approach an acquaintance or a rabbi. And they know they may be jeopardizing the relationship with their family, friends, co-workers, as well as their jobs, and they justly fear the lack of welcome on part of the Jewish communities that may seek to join. And for this reason, many conversos in their journey, they go to Messianic Judaism. Like in my case, when I went through my journey, I first went to a Messianic congregation, and that was a stepping stone that then, along the way, with the help of military rabbis, that they guided me, and I was able then to go to a normal Jewish community, and that in that process, I initiated the process of conversion. And Neyman, and Neyman Musa, or an unnamed converser, says the following. Please remember that we conversos have a lot of pain inside of us, which, which we have to deal with. This one soul still feels the pain, the burden of apostasy of our ancestor over a 600-year period. Common things about conversos is accepting. What does it mean to be Jewish? Is it that having ancestry or practice? Is it that you have a family tradition? Is it that you have a DNA? Is it that you have the heart that you feel that you're Jewish? They, that's quite a question that even we're trying to grasp of what it really means to be a Jew. Does DNA really matters? Does it really matter that we get a DNA testing that certificate certifies that we have Jewish ancestry, even though there are no records that the genealogical records that can prove that we're Jewish? Is the concept of a Jewish soul a valid concept? Many conversos, they say when they come back that they're coming because they have a longing that they feel that they have a Jewish heart, that they have a love for Israel. They have a love for the Jewish people. They have a love for the practices and traditions. Is it because of that love that they are Jewish or that's just a feeling, a, pas a charade or a passage that that makes them Jewish or that's just a desire that just happens for a little while? And that's a question, as you say, how might DNA play a role, if at all? And I mean, that is something that some Jewish uh, rabbinical courts, day to this day, do not accept. And that is something that is being struggle, is they're struggling with. And they're trying, many people that advocate the tradition that it has to be true ancestry. And some modern rabbis, they're trying to push that DNA should be accepted as a way to recognize that an individual is indeed a converso. Like, for example, I'll give an example. There's a girl from Mexico that I was referred to by the UJA that she did her DNA test because she wanted to find out from what Indian tribe, I mean, Mexican Indian tribe she belonged to because she was very active with the Mexican communities in, I mean, the, Me the Indian Mexican communities in Mexico. And she's an advocate for this community in New York. She was doing her master's thesis, planning to do her master's thesis about the Indian tribes. And she wanted to learn her, her DNA testing so that way she could identify herself 
to that given Indian tribes that she belonged to. To her surprise, the DNA test reflected that she was not actually a descendant from any of the Indian tribes, but rather that he, she had Jewish DNA. And I was referred to her, I mean, she was referred to me so in that way to start a conversation about what it meant for her to be have that Jewish DNA ancestry. She's a practicing Roman Catholic, but she was like in that process of struggling about her identity, about her that she was raised all her life believing that she was a Roman Catholic, that she was an Indian from Mexico. And then all of a sudden she's finding out that her ancestry was not Roman Catholic, that she was Jewish, and that her lineage was really from the Sephardim. So that is a huge struggle that she had that identity crisis, that she's still struggling with it. She hasn't communicated with me because she's in that process of the journey of discovering and a journey of introspection. And that is a process that is long and painful to process. And it's a journey. And every Jew faced discrimination in their own lives. And now, normative Jewish communities are not realizing that they're the, making the same mistake to converse us when they get rejected by the suspicion about the authenticity of their Jewishness. Another theme is what is community. And one question that we have to ask is what does an emerging Latino Jewish community would look like? What are the requirements for them to be part of this community? And it is interesting to note that these emerging Latino communities are sometimes stronger than well-established Jewish communities. There's a stronger sense of family. They are eager to be actively involved. And one of the challenges that we face and the movements is how we can provide them with resources. Like for example, the rabbinical assembly, they do not have a prayer book in Spanish. The only one that I know of is one that was developed at the seminary in Buenos Aires. And this seminar, this uh, sedur, which was over 20 years old, it doesn't have transliteration. It is not inclusive that it doesn't have the prayers for the mothers. And this is a problem because Latinos and potential conversos to come back to Judaism, they do not have the facilities, like for example, the translated Hebrew, nor the prayer books in Spanish that they can do these prayers. Neither you kind of find in the movements like Spanish translations of the Tanakh. And those are challenges that we have. The issue of, of identity is that com for conversos, each one has a unique identity. Some of them, it comes from discovering discover their heritage. Some of them, it comes from the unexplained love and fascination towards Judaism and or the state of Israel. And one interesting fact about this is that for many Latinos, they have a strong link to the state of Israel. And I think it's cultural because many Latinos, they left first Spain to Latin America and then they leave Latin America to the state in which they leave their motherland. And then they feel that they're like strangers in a strange land and they long for their motherland. Just like all Jews in their tradition, they long for the state of Israel. Another interesting fact is that Jews, they have kept their traditional life and they have kept their language. Latinos, they have a unique, it's a unique phenomena because unlike other ethnic groups, when they come to the United States, they keep their language and they keep their traditions. And I'm not talking about 10 or 20 years. They have kept it for since I know that, like, for example, the Puerto Ricans that came in the first wave of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, they kept their language. They kept their culture. And you can see this, like, for example, in New York, the Puerto Rican parade. 
and very similar, they see that there's a parallelism of the way that Latinos and Jews, they keep their culture, which is a unique phenomenon because Latinos, they mirror very similarly to what the Jewish communities have strived to survive by keeping their traditions and their language. Others, they keep their identity because for an unknown force or reason, they are brought back towards Judaism. And what is interesting is that the common message is that none of them, of these um, reasons, is more or less valid. All of them are valid reasons for the conversos. So the reality is that for some conversos, they can prove their Jewish ancestry. However, this is a long process. Like in my case, my conversion was completed in 2017. And it was not until January 2023 that I got my certification that I did. I had Jewish ancestry. Others, they cannot prove it because for the circumstances that the records were burned and it's extremely difficult for some people to be able to get their genealogies. However, all of them feel in their soul that they're 100% Jewish. Even now, 200 years from the Spanish Inquisition, the locations affected appears to be poorer, more religious, less educated, and less trusting. And this is from an article it's called The Effects of the Spanish Inquisition Lingers to This Day. Economics, education, and trust are all affected. The Latinos that are born Jewish, that are conservative, I mean, the traditional Jews in Latin America, they are usually financially affluent. But in the case of conversos, they come from many walks of life, and most of them are either in the middle class or are below the middle class level. Mo many of them, they don't have education. They have a strong link to religion, unlike the traditional Jewish, that most of them are more linked with the secular, like the Jewish communities, which are flourishing in Latin America. But in the case of the Latino, the, con the conversos, they are more aligned when they um, discover their Jewishness with the synagogue. So it is another challenge because they are not as well established economically and educationally like the traditional Jews, uh, Latino Jews. And that is a challenge because, for example, as far as I know, I am the only student rabbi of Converso heritage that is currently pursuing rabbinical study as far as I know, I haven't met anyone of my ancestry that is pursuing rabbinical studies. So another question of the, and a challenge about Jews by choice or by chance. And the reality is that there's a disparity between, of how we treat those Jews by choice and those who are by birth, which is also known as Jews by chance. And emerging Latino Jewish communities, they face lack of access to resources, especially in Spanish. They face anti-Semitism. And they face animosity within existing Jewish communities. There's also a big challenge for us because there is mistrust and suspicion when a convert comes to the process and that person is not doing it because they're marrying into Judaism. Because usually when there's a relationship in which the person is going to get married with a Jew, that process is much easier than of someone that just wants to become Jewish and they are not marrying into the community. And there's a lost history. Many conversos had their Jewish heritage erased, heritage erased. They're struggling with this fact and they're trying to reconnect with their Judaism. And this is a new emerging side of Judaism. And these communities are fighting for their right to exist and to be recognized as Jewish. And the challenge that all communities have and all the movements have and the rabbinical and the leadership, the rabbinical and cantorial leadership is how we can accept these emerging communities into the larger Jewish communities. So there's a Sephardic prayer that states the following. May he who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and Aaron, David, and Solomon, 
bless, preserve, guard, and seize all our bedroom. Imprisoned by the Inquisition, may the King of Kings bless them and make them worthy of his grace. And hearken the voice of their supplications and bring them forth from darkness to light. May such be thy divine will and let us say amen. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. I'm going to now open the floor for questions and answers and discussions about the challenges of the conversos to our communities and anyone, any questions that anyone might have. I did see someone drop in the chat a question about DNA. Um, I'm not sure if Mona, if you're still on, if you want to explain at what point you dropped that in, maybe we can get, dig into that. Uh, sure. I, I just wondered because in the discussion it was mentioned that there was there were questions about DNA and the validity of DNA. So my question was just how might DNA be utilized today? And, and the question was answered in the talk. Yeah, and that's as I said, that's be that's a current conversation in a risk and that's the rabbis are struggling with it and the movements. I'm not I will not be surprised that the reform movement will be willing to accept DNA. The conservative is going to struggle with it, but eventually they'll accept it. But the orthodox, I think they're going to have a difficult time. Maybe the modern orthodox might accept it, but it's going to be a long way. So I don't think that I might be able to see that being accepted in my lifetime, that the orthodox will fully embrace DNA. But I might be surprised because now they, they are embracing female rabbis. And while we get to the questions and a challenge that conversos have is that we need more representation in the leadership, in the rabbinical, in the cantorial. So in that way, they can bring forth the needs of this community. Because unfortunately, there are not many rabbis that know about this community or that can represent them and advocate for them. Rabbi? Yes. Rabbi? Um, I, I also, I am a uh, descendant from Sephardic Portuguese Jews, and I also um, could prove my, my ancestors to the lineage, all the lineage. Um, I had to, to look at genealogists, to pay for the studies, and uh, we went through all documentations and we found uh, many, many um, uh, Jewish uh, uh, people in my family, in my, my ancestors in Portugal. Then I, I went to Portugal and I visit uh, places over there in the north of Portugal. We can see the, the history uh, of uh, the Sephardic Jews living in Portugal. And um, I discovered that by chance, because I was doing my own genealogy and then I started seeing uh, how it was important in my ancestry. And when I discovered that, I, I talking to my, the cousins of my father, I realized it's so many things that now my, she could, my 93 year old um, cousin, she understood uh, how her grandfather, would light the candles on Saturday, uh, uh, Friday nights, and so many things. And we discovered that the Judaism um, was uh, practiced and hidden in the Catholic in Brazil. So they would pretend that they were Catholic, mm -hmm. but they would have many things, uh, even getting married uh, among Jewish. All of, I can see how many Jews I have in my tree. And I felt this connection very strongly in my life. And when I told this to my brothers and my cousins, many of us felt the same, like even being raised in Catholicism, suddenly like everyone would understand and feel the connection with um, uh, the Hebrew. So for me, it's 
been an experience in my life very important. Um, I ended up get, also getting a certificate from, from the Israeli community in Port Lisbon uh, because they, 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 they saw all the documentation and they gave me a certificate saying that I, I descend from uh, the Sephardic Portuguese, the, from the Inquisition. And I went to the, to the, to the um, uh, it's called Tombo Tower. It's a, like a place that has the registration of the Inquisition that even the torture that the priests would do to the uh, Jewish people in Portugal at that time, they didn't hide. Like in the Holocaust, we don't know what they did. But in the Inquisition, they made sure that everything was written in details, that the priests were allowed to do torture so they could get the, the Jews to, to say that who were else were practicing Judaism at that time. And if they didn't say who was practicing Judaism, they would go ahead and kill their family and the other Jews. So if you didn't say, then you would be... Um, killed and burned and I saw the details of my ancestors um, um, being suffering the Inquisition by the Catholic Inquisition in Portugal. So and now I am after I discovered this after being married to a, a Jewish man, my, my Ashkenazi. Uh, I, I belong to, to I'm a member of the synagogue uh, here in, in San Diego Beth Israel and I being a member, as because in an inter interfaith marriage, I discover my 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 own Judaism, and uh, this is happening to me right now. I just wanted to share because I connected to you, and you said that you also have the certification. Maybe it's the same that I I got from from Portugal uh, congregation of yeah, um, Jewish congregation in Lisbon. Well, first of all, muito obrigado. Or thank you very much in Portuguese. Yes. <laughs> um, the you. thing is that I did not want to talk much about the tortures because some of them were are gruesome. And I mean, it's something we can talk in private, but the tortures are something that if you read them, it sounds yeah. like if it comes from a horror movie that it is commensurate, like let's say a Freddy Krueger movie or Friday 13th movie because they were horrendous deaths and they did it on purpose that they wanted to make the person suffer and to make the death as painful and as cruciating as possible because they supposedly that was the way to keep everything holy and by doing that the inquisitors they were cleansing themselves of their sins so they were actually going to be forgiven for actually making other human beings suffer and I hope we can connect after this presentation because I think we have a lot of stories to share of our journey. In my case, it was that to give a little story about how I came into grasp with my Judaism is that um, I had questions about my faith. I had to go to, uh, to, I was at that time in the military that I was sent to a training in Nelly Air Force Base in Las Vegas, Nevada. When I was returning, I was seated, I mean, I was in the show after I turned my car rental, and I sat near an Orthodox rabbi. And we had a conversation. And then before I left, he told me that I was Jewish and that my heritage was calling me back. And I thought that the guy was crazy. I, did, I completely ignored him. And what happened is that I was questioning my, my faith. So I went to a Christian seminary. And after that first time, uh, when I started, the most dreaded classes were the languages. So the first, what I did that to knock it out, I took Hebrew. And to get my ears accustomed to the Hebrew, I went to a Messianic synagogue. And then when I started listening to the prayers, I remember that my grandfather, when I was a child, he prayed three times a day, and he did it in a strange language that I had no idea what it was. Mm -hmm. And when I listened to the Hebrew prayers, I reconnected that it was actually the prayers that my grandfather did. And that's where I started my quest, and that's how I got into this journey 
of rediscovering my Judaism. Yeah, this connection with language also happened with me because I met my Jewish husband in a, in a, a Jew, in an Israeli show music and I was attracted to Israeli language and Israeli music uh, much before that I discovered all of this. So I was um, kind of, I, when I first heard the um, Israeli song, uh, in Hebrew, I felt like I was understanding what it was meaning, mm -hmm. and then I went to the to to the to the lyrics and they did translation to Portuguese. I lived in Brazil there ten years ago, so I went to to I saw the the, the lyrics and the feeling of the song. I had received it about the lyrics even if I didn't know Hebrew, and mm -hmm. then that was was I went started my connection with the. The Israeli music, and then I got married. I I met my my husband, who is who is Jewish. So um, it happens; those things, like this connection, also comes in in me myself. I feel that I am Jewish. That's how I feel. Yeah, and all conversos, they feel they're a hundred percent authentic Jewish. That there's no that it, it is authentic that we're Jewish and we're just a different side of Judaism different to the Ashkenazi tradition yes. but nevertheless we're Jewish yes. yeah thank you you're welcome any more questions or comments I have a question. Um, sure. Wonderful, absolutely fascinating, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, why do you think that this history is still so hidden and that it's not shared and more widely recognized? It has to deal cultural, political, because first of all, the books of history has to be rewritten, especially Spanish history. Second of all, that I think that Spain is not willing to recognize the history because it might open a Pandora's box, especially with the issue of reparation. And Spain economically is not a, in a good situation to be able to pay for reparations. Another one that is a challenge also to the normative Jewish communities, because then they'll have to come to grasp on how to handle this. And this is a challenge. I'm not saying that it is not, I mean, it is a challenge, not just accepting it, but how to deal with them. And some communities are ready, some other communities are not ready. And I mean, we need to get ready because this is, in my opinion, Latin, emerging Latino Jewish communities is a source that we can bring energy and vibrancy to our current Jewish communities that are dying. And I think that embracing the Latinos and especially the conversos, is going to bring a new, I mean, a needed boost that many Jewish communities that need right now, that they're struggling to exist. But it's a question that I really, I don't know. It's one of those things that I don't know why it is not happening, but I'm just saying what I believe might be the reasons that they are not being acknowledged. I see that there, Lisa, who goes first to ask, because there are two people that have questions, I think. Yeah, we can start with Nanette and then go to Mona. All right, Nanette. Hi. Okay, thanks. Sorry, Mona. I know your hand was up first. Um, have you ever been to the Jewish um, Museum in, in uh, Granada, Spain? No, I have not been. Have you heard of it? I have heard of it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because it's, when we were visiting... You know, Spain, it's like a one woman show where she's determined to keep that part of history alive and let people know um, about conversos and everything. And it's very small. It's like a part of her house. But um, and her husband's a professor in that town. That's what, but she's just so determined um, to keep it alive. So it is a great little place to visit. And not just that, don't you find it interesting that a woman is the one that is leading this effort? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's interesting. Interestingly, too, um, my husband's Puerto Rican, 
didn't know we, he had in Gishertish, but recently his cousin, or I don't know how recently, his cousin lost all her siblings and one of them to a rare disease and um, come to find out that that it's the one that you, you know, she's, they're Jewish, you know, because you only have that disease if you're both your parents um, have, you know, were Jewish or whatever. So like you say this, and, and there's so many, you know, um, Jews out there every which way you go. Yeah. I have a friend of mine that actually he's um, Puerto Rican. I'm also from Puerto Rico. And oh. the way that he discovered his Jewishness was that his brother succumbed to this illness. Mm. And that made him to get into a journey. I mean, he is a guy that he's a Vietnam veteran that shows his age. And then in his advanced age, he converted to Judaism and even his grandchildren, they are now practiced Judaism. He's in the conservative synagogue. And the thing that is his pride is to be able, that even though he did not live most of his life as Jew, but to be able to pass the traditions and to see his grandchildren being raised with openly with the family identity as Jewish. Uh, nice. Yeah. Um, our kids are definitely born and raised in Beth Israel and Jewish, you know, very proud of it and very proud of being Puerto Rican too. And we are actually flying out tonight to go see his parents in Ponce. So yeah, my, fa my father's family is from Ponce. Oh, interesting. Probably and you know, one thing is that uh, Puerto Rican Jews are called, I don't know if you know this, that a name for Puerto Rican Jews is Jurican. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, we're called Juricans. Okay. Good Just like New Yorkans, but in the case Juricans, and you can find flags. There's a t-shirt that I saw that is the flag of Puerto Rico, and the star is replaced with the Magen David, oh. and it says Jurican. Okay, I'll look for it. My yeah, I found a cookbook. I found a cookbook that I bought, and I also sent this cousin um, about. You know, it, it was all these people who came. You know, a Jewish cookbook, but Puerto Rican Jewish cookbook in English and in Spanish. So that was pretty. Yeah, cool. that you can get rice with pigeon peas, <laughs> and, and so something else is that, like for example, for Christmas they do pernil, but in the case of now the they have included included pavochon, which is they do the turkey just like the roasted pig, but they use turkey. Oh, okay. Good to know. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah, I'll guess yes. it is. Yes, no, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so very much for this very insightful presentation. And I have uh, more of a comment to make because I, I spent over 20 years in the United States Air Force. And for a few of those years, I was stationed in Madrid, Spain. Mm -hmm. While I was in Spain, I had the opportunity to attend a very special presentation at the synagogue in Madrid, and that presentation was specifically put on by, at that time, King Juan Carlos. He was the king of Spain in 1992. So 1992 was the 500th anniversary of the Spanish Inquisition, right, 1492, and he and made the conquest of the new world. That's correct. So the king of Spain at that time had a very large, it was this world famous event. It was televised all over and I happened to have the opportunity to attend this presentation. So I saw the king stand up before the world and literally apologize to Jewish people for the Spanish Inquisition. And I am wondering if you are aware of this Yes. Event number one, and no, idea of them no, but I know that they have tried to do reparations in some way by the giving them the um the converse of Spanish citizenship. Okay, that's it. I was just wondering if you did know that. Okay, and, and one other additional question. So my my lineage is specifically a Sephardim from Greece. And I'm wondering if you could speak to any knowledge you might have as the conversos, because I have no knowledge. As far as I know, everyone in my family is Jewish for generations back. Yeah. So I'm wondering yeah. if it was it just amongst the Jews that left Spain and went to other Spanish countries, or, or are you aware of, of the other areas? The majority of the conversos, they went to the New World. Maybe some, they went to Europe or the eastern side of Europe. 
but the majority of the Jews that went to eastern side of Europe, to Morocco, to Turkey, were Jews that did not convert, that they okay. continued keeping their practices. So very few converts went to Eastern Europe. They felt that in the New World, they, they were still under Spanish colonies. They kept their language. It was like, for them, it was much easier than, let's say, going to Holland, that they had to learn a new language and a new culture. I see. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, I want to thank you again for being with our community today. I, I can tell just by the Q&A how interested everyone was in this topic. Um, uh, for anyone um, that wants to watch this again, we did record it. It'll be on the Beth Israel YouTube channel. So if you have any friends or family members that you'd like to share this with, the link will be up there later this afternoon. I think there's another question. Nanette? Oh, I, oh, no, wait, Nanette, is that a question or an applause? A applause. <laughs> I, I, okay. had a, I had just a brief question. I was wondering, or I don't know if this is brief or not. I was wondering um, what the rest of your family have, has, have, have any other members of your family converted as well? or gotten back no. in touch with their... Uh, and usually, like in my case, I'm the only one that converted. The rest of my family, they have stayed Christian. And do they accept accept you and your conversion? What are their thoughts about it? Um, I mean, some of my family have accepted. Some of them, they are struggling with it. But I have some family members that have accepted it. And we still have a relate. Um, mutual respectful relationship in which even though they are some of them are catholic i respect their journey and they respect my journey in judaism and they also accept my career choice of becoming a rabbi okay wonderful well again thank you so much um Joseph, uh, Lisa had to run, but she said she'll call you later. <laughs> okay. Have a great day. Happy Monday. You too. Thank you so much.